Dando início, então, ao painel 4, com o tema Antropologia das Finanças. Convidamos como moderador o doutor Federico Nyborg, PHD, coordenador do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Antropologia Social do Museu Nacional. E para compor a mesa, convidamos o Dr. Bill Maurer, PhD, do Institute of Money, Technology and Financial Inclusion, da Universidade da Califórnia, Irvine. <risos> Dr. Juan Pablo Pardo Guerra, PhD, Departamento de Sociologia da Universidade de Cali da Califórnia, San Diego. E também, senhor Maurício Prado, sócio da Plano CDE. Com a palavra, então, o moderador, doutor Federico Nyborg. I will introduce, in a, using only a few minutes, uh, I will speak in Portuguese, I think it will be better. Eh, a primeira coisa, então, é agradecer muito aos organizadores da, da conferência, a José Alexandre Vasco, Frederico Xu e os outros organizadores por ter aberto esse espaço tão importante para nós, para apresentar um pouco nesse contexto que a antropologia, a nossa disciplina, tem para contribuir às discussões eh, da, da conferência. Então, esse, esse é o ponto principal. O segundo ponto é dizer que estamos muito satisfeitos por ter conseguido montar essa mesa, contando com pesquisadores tão ilustres, tão importantes, que estão aqui, como o professor Bill Moller, da Universidade de Califórnia, Irvine, que é uma referência para todos nós nos estudos das relações entre, digamos assim, os regimes de legalidade, as práticas financeiras, e o, o significado do dinheiro. É, o professor Bill Moore dirige há muitos anos um instituto de pesquisas que é, se tornou uma referência, sobretudo no que diz respeito à a, 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 a compreensão etnográfica, antropológica, a respeito das relações entre as pessoas, os usos do dinheiro e as tecnologias, e sobre isso é que é, o, ele vai falar hoje. É, também é um prazer enorme contar na mesa com Juan Pablo Pardo Guerra, é, doutor em estudos da ciência e da tecnologia, é, também um especialista nos, é, nos, é, na sociologia ou na socioantropologia das finanças, especialmente focada nas inovações tecnológicas. É, e, por fim, é, também é um prazer contar com Maurício Prado, mestre em antropologia da, é, e é, especialista, é, coordenador de uma importante pesquisa sobre práticas financeiras nas classes, nas chamadas classes C e D. Então, não vou me estender mais, eu vou passar a palavra para os expositores, com a esperança de ter algum tempo, talvez, para, inclusive, abrir e ter é, perguntas e ter algum debate. Então, muito obrigado. Vamos começar. By thanking the organizers, I'll begin by thanking the organizers um, and wishing a happy 40th birthday to CVM, as everyone has been doing. It is a birthday party after all. Um, I'd also just take a moment to acknowledge and thank in advance our technical support guys, because um, the, hopefully the, the gods of PowerPoint will shine upon us and everything will be okay, so we'll thank them. And also I would like to thank in advance the interpreters, our translators in the back. Um, and to apologize to them, I sent along a script in advance, but I am sure to deviate from it. So with that, um, let me begin. I want to begin just by situating a little bit the discipline of anthropology and then get into the contributions um, of anthropology to the convening here. Anthropology as an academic discipline had its roots in European colonial expansion and conquest. We can't forget that. Such expansion was generally about money and finance, extracting new sources of wealth from gold and silver to timber and slave labor. Missionaries and proto-ethnologists 
accompanying, accompanying the colonial endeavor were stunned by the range of things that seemed to be used as currency around the world. From shells to braids of tobacco to giant nearly immovable stones. Exposure to this profusion of what seemed to be forms of money led to the development, once the field professionalized, of several anthropological positions on money. And I'm just going to outline for you the anthropological orthodoxy here on money. Number one, that primitive money is to be distinguished from modern money in that the former, primitive, is special purpose money um, employed only for exchanges involving certain things or transactions or in specific bounded domains of social life, say uh, payments associated with marriage or payments associated with death or religious rituals. While the latter, general purpose money, is able to be employed uh, for everything, all kinds of transactions across domains universally. Number two, that special purpose monies um, can be used for each of the classic Aristotelian functions of money, that you might have one money serving the function of being a medium of exchange and something entirely different, an entirely different object serving the function of being a store of value, for instance. Um, number three, that when modern money emerged um, as a sort of universal money or a general purpose money, it became the measuring rod against which all things could be evaluated, that you could take all of the things of the universe and put them in a hierarchy based on their value in money. And number four, that the, the colonial experience and the experience of history generally has been the supplanting of special purpose monies by, uh, gen by general purpose money. Um, and that, that that supplanting, that that transition um, from special purpose to general purpose, that along with that went um, a kind of flattening, the flattening of objects and relationships, meanings, purposes, and modes of evaluation by replacing them with one mode of value only, measured in terms of money, tied to the market logic of supply, demand, and price. So the general story here that anthropology has told, at least until very recently, is that you go from profusion of special purpose monies to singularity, to, to the general purpose money. That money um, diminishes social or familial connection um, and does it with this sort of flat wash of anonymous cash. And so the story goes. And you'll detect in my outline here um, and in my talk today a skepticism toward this story. As money today, our general purpose money, is very often, often used for special purposes, often still quite magical, still plural, and turned to all kinds of ends that um, may be surprising to us, except when we remember that this is a birthday party, and what do you do at birthdays? You give gifts, right? And when you gift money, there are very particular rituals around the gifting of money. Put it in a card, for instance. Wrap it in some way. Now, there's also been... Um, a profusion of electronic means of payment. And for those of you who were here on Monday, um, you'll appreciate the kind of financial technology dimension of what I'm gonna be talking about in a bit. And a, a lot of that discussion um, around FinTech, particularly new ways of paying, um, I think is very much bound up with the idea that, that we can replace cash, um, we can think about Kenneth Rogoff's new book, The Curse of Cash. We can also think about this old, uh, old advertisement um, with Danny Kay. His, he's holding a newspaper that says, Cash Died Today. This was for a promotional film advertising the Diners Club card, if you remember the Diners Club credit card, the first, the first charge card. Um, there's this whole interest in replacing cash with fintech. And what's interesting is that um, when we start to see these new developments in financial technology, we start to see some of this re-segmentation of general purpose money into special purpose money. Um, for instance, uh, you know, different means of payment um, are used, oh sorry, I just, put up, I just put up death of cash, Modi, India, just because that's happening right now and we should be thinking about it and it's kind of been amazing to watch. So uh, this is what I wanted to show you next. 
Um, with, with all of these new services that we have and these new ways to pay, um, we're starting to see a diversity of forms of digital payment using different channels and technologies from the earphone jack used by Square to the screen and camera used by Level Up. Um, all of these different modes of payment are being used for different special purposes now. So we can think of um, the app Venmo, which a lot of young people use within Facebook um, mainly to pay for pay friends, right? It's sort of little payments among friends. It's not being used to shop online, which was what its designers initially intended it to be. Um, instead, it's being used for very special purposes in small networks, in small groups of close friends. My colleagues and I um, have dubbed the present era a Cambrian explosion in payments. The Cambrian period, you might remember, in evolutionary biology was the time when life on Earth rapidly expanded into many new niches, adapting and, in so doing, evolving into a great diversity of body types, most of which are extinct today, and which, if we saw them running around, we might assume to be from another planet. The Cambrian explosion in payments has revealed, I think, another anthropological insight about money, that money is never just a means of exchange, a method of payment, or a store of value. It's also not just a way of recording and remembering debts and credits, although this is perhaps even more central to money than its other classic functions. Money is fundamentally a social phenomenon. People do things with it to express all sorts of commitments and values, not just to exchange monetary value. So for instance, if you use Level Up, which I don't know if anybody here has ever seen, it's the it's the, the second thing in there, the second one from the left, you're doing it just to be cool, right? There's absolutely no reason to do that and not as opposed to using a credit card or just handing over cash. Um, it's cumbersome, it's a little ridiculous, it's very high tech and futuristic, you're doing it to look cool and that's it. Um, if you're using, I mean, I could be even more rude about Apple Pay, but I won't do that now. Um, we're using it to express other commitments and values. And when we do so, we're also engaging with different infrastructures, some of which are private, some of which are public, but also some of which are social or communal, communal infrastructures, our own relationships. And I'm going to spend the remainder of my remarks today just with two case studies to demonstrate these points and to indicate their implications for financial technology adoption and uh, consumer finance education today. So let's start with uh, mobile phone enabled money transfer services or so-called mobile money. Best exemplified by the Kenyan service M-Pesa, which was launched by the Kenyan telecommunications provider Safaricom. M-Pesa allows users to send money via a simple text message over a standard GSM phone. So you're not using a smartphone, you're using a basic phone here to do this. Philanthropic agencies and other donor, other donor organizations and governments saw in this, tech, in this technology the potential to bank the unbanked because mobile network and device penetration far exceeds that of formal financial institutions or brick and mortar banks. The research center that I direct, the Institute for Money, Technology, and Financial Inclusion, has since 2008, with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, been exploring mobile money around the world, looking at how it intersects and interacts with cash and other traditional means of money savings and transfer. And we've discovered a few surprising things. First, let's take Haiti. When mobile money services were introduced in Haiti there, shortly after the 2010 earthquake, specifically to facilitate internal domestic remittances. It was introduced specifically to allow me to send you money, um, given the, all the disaster and the, the, the wrecked infrastructure in the country that made mobility difficult. Um, when it was first launched, though, researchers noticed an interesting trend. People were putting cash into their mobile account via a local shop, a local kiosk, but they were not sending it to anybody else. Instead, they would just leave it there and then withdraw it later somewhere else. Why were they doing this? Well, uh, ethnographers supported by my institute found that people were basically using the service as a temporary lockbox for money when they traveled, which provided them a sense of security and reduced the risk of being robbed. This was not saving, per se, 
It was just protecting or guarding the money for short-term purposes. Um, and it was associated with the risks of traveling the countryside with cash. Second, another case, Northern Ghana in West Africa. Researchers there wanted to understand how mobile money was actually being used in some remote parts of the country, exactly the kinds of places where the Gates Foundation had hoped that mobile money would serve as an on-ramp to formal financial services and savings. Okay? What they found instead was this, and hopefully this will work if my tech guys, so that there, there will be sound hopefully. Okay. People were consulting soothsayers, like this guy, to ask their ancestors about the proper places and occasions to use mobile money to pay for ritual obligations. Things like payments required to kin at the death of a relative, things like birth or marriage. Saving was not on their mind. Rather, social obligations were what was on their mind. Even more interesting, and hopefully this next the, video will also work. The ah, process listen. then is a process where the clan head uses that to ask questions to the ancestor, gets the answers, and then. This is our researcher ask. explaining but what he we didn't just go saw. on his own. We asked him to kindly ask his ancestor about certain questions, and we asked about the use of mobile phones for texting, um, making calls, browsing, and other things. And then we also ask, you can see that the money is passing through the mobile phone to someone. Um, what are the things that we can pass through, uh, we can use the mobile phone to channel money to someone. And then whether, and then somebody asked, uh, my brother here asked whether the, the subsidies might accept payment of their consultation fee using mobile money. But uh, it appears that they said no. The aura the oracle was to touch and feel the consultation fee. So we had to pay cash and get a receipt for it. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what he just said, just because you may, you may have missed it. This is the, the researcher, Francis Santua, the ethnographer, describing the scene that we just saw in the other video to, another, to a group of researchers at the University of California. And what he says, he's just explaining the process, that they went with another person, with another agent, another intermediary, to go meet the soothsayer, who is himself an intermediary, to ask the soothsayer about all of these transactions involving the dead. So he explains that. And then he says, but my brother here has asked me, um, will the soothsayer accept payment in mobile money? And the answer, he says, is no. The soothsayer wants to touch and feel the consultation fee, and so the soothsayer only will accept cash, so he says, so we paid him cash and we got a receipt for it, okay? There's a couple lessons here for financial education. Um, first, think about the role of the intermediaries here, like the, the soothsayer um, and also the agent who brought, in this case, the researcher or would bring a client um, to the soothsayer. That person matters very much. Even if they're being consulted about the use of mobile money, if they themselves aren't going to accept mobile money, that says something to the client of the soothsayer about this product, right? Um, we often forget that people like religious leaders are unbelievably significant um, in people's lives in helping to disseminate ideas about new financial products and also in providing a kind of financial education, even if some of what they're providing is wrong, um, to the populace. It doesn't, you can think the, the church leader, you can think the soothsayer, think about the guy who sells lottery tickets. The man who sells lottery tickets to you is one of your main touch points for thinking about money and finance, right? So can that guy be used as an agent for financial education? It poses quite a challenge to this community, um, but I think that, that that's the kind of challenge that we face, especially with some of these new services. Um, when we talk about things like, say, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, which is what mobile money was supposed to facilitate, I just send money directly to you over the mobile, um, we have to do what my colleague, uh, the anthropologist Taylor Nelms, says, 
and mind our P's and our 2's in the expression P2P for peer to peer. Mind our P's and 2's. That is, we have to acknowledge that first, social networks here are really the key drivers in uptake and adoption of new financial products. Intermediaries are the educators. We can try to be the educators, but if we don't reach those intermediaries, we're not going to get very far. Second, with respect to the two, the number two in P2P, we have to acknowledge that infrastructure, plain and simple, is often the primary limiting factor in the adoption of any new financial technology. If the electrical grid is unreliable, after all, you have to depend on the guy with the car battery mobile phone charging station in order to get the job done. In the soothsayer case, we also see the incredible resilience of cash, of physical tokens of exchangeable value. That soothsayer wants to touch and feel the money. No mobile or digital value for him. Again and again, we have found that cash is preferred even when safer alternatives are available. It's very hard to compete with cash um, that's held in a cupboard or a hole in the ground or in the roof rafters. Um, and when we talk about things like developing educational uh, programs around savings, which it's assumed means savings in a bank, where suddenly my savings is invisible to me, we have to remember that our main competitor is cash and other means of saving in a physical, tangible way. So cash, cattle, land, um, houses, that sort of thing. Cash, because of this infrastructure issue I mentioned, cash always works. It doesn't require any special knowledge or technology. It doesn't depend on whether or not the lights go out. Its adoption in all sorts of ritual practices too, from temple or church offerings to decorating the nuptial bed or decorating the dead, lends it a special quasi-magical quality that's difficult to shake. Now, I've just given you two very brief examples from an ever-growing archive of how people interact with new financial technologies that were designed with the intent of onboarding them into um, the formal financial sector. And I could go on and on and on and on, but I'm not going to. Um, I, instead, I will just conclude um, by reiterating a couple key points. Whoops. Which? Uh, there. Um, so what matters? So uh, I'm going to say things a little out of order here. Use matters. How people use things really matters. And anthropology, ethnography excels at providing rich case studies of money and technology in practice how people actually enlist money in all its forms to enact social commitments and obligations, how their economies are thoroughly intertwined with their cosmologies, beliefs, and ritual practices. Understanding how to drive uptake and adoption of new services and provide education about them requires this kind of user-focused research that gets beyond whatever a panel survey might tell you and instead really sits alongside people as they engage in some of their most intimate behaviors. And we have to remember that money things are among people's most intimate behaviors. They might tell you one thing um, if you're an official, they might tell you one thing if you're administering a survey, you will learn a whole different side of life if you're living with them for an extended period of time and really gaining access to what they're actually doing. So use matters. Um, I said already intermediaries matter. If we don't reach those people who are the prime intermediaries for people between them and other financial products and services, we're not going to succeed. The intermediary might not be you know, the, an old wise person. It might even be a kid, right? It might be the child who understands how to use the phone or how to use the computer that the parent does not understand. We need to then educate that person. Um, and finally, uh, infrastructure matters. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, often, new technologies sit on top of very old infrastructures. Sometimes they try to adapt an existing infrastructure, like the mobile network in the cases that I discussed. Um, adapting that to new ends like financial service provision. This obviously has regulatory implications. Um, so, you know, a mobile network operator is not a bank, and so there are regulatory implications there. But it also has implications because infrastructures are often like the railroad tracks, in that once they're set down, they create certain path dependencies. These can either facilitate or thwart user intentions. 
and can also often channel energies and resources in unexpected ways. And we need to be attending to the unexpe unexpected ways that infrastructures channel people one way or another. And I believe my colleague Juan Pablo will be saying a little bit more about the infrastructure point. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.